All righty, welcome to April 28th. Uh, today, I want to continue working with the feet, but we're going to start with some core body movements and then work with our hands a little bit and then work with the feet. It's a lot easier. We can reach our hands easier and that what we learn there will apply to the feet. So come and sit up at the front of your chair so that when you look down, the hair underneath your thighs. And put your arms out to the side and no higher than your shoulders. And if that's uncomfortable, go a little lower and roll your thumbs forward. So your thumbs come forward and begin to go down toward the floor a little bit. Just see how far they go. And then roll your thumbs backward and see how far they go. Okay, and rest your arms for a moment. And now we're gonna wake up the ability for our body to flex and arch. So look down, and when you look down, imagine somebody is pulling your waistband in the back, and your whole body is making this, if I turn sideways, this C shape. You can feel your sit bones on the chair and they kind of slide a little forward under you. And that tilts your pelvis and the tilt of your pelvis allows your belly to pull in and for you to really round your back. Good, okay, come back. And then to arch your back, imagine your body is like a stick, your spine is a stick and tilt it forward a little bit. And once it's tilted, push your belly out roll your shoulders back and you get this this lovely arching and go back and forth between those a few times really focus and sense what's happening with your sit bones how when you're arched your sit bone is pointed back behind you and when you're rounded your sit bone points forward if you were a a, a dog and you had a tail when you round, the tail would come between your legs and up. And when you arch, if you had a tail, you'd be wagging it behind you. Okay. And then rest for a moment. And put your arms out again. And see which of those movements, arching or rounding, goes with rolling your thumbs forward. So if you round your body, how far can your thumbs wrap around? Or if you arch your body, how far do your thumbs wrap around? And when you find the one that makes you feel freer to move your thumbs, do it a few times. So when you arch, your thumbs will probably go backwards a little more. And when you round, your thumbs can come forward. Okay. And rest for a moment. This ability to, to know when you're arched, when you're rounded, and when you're in between is really important for, for posture and for walking and for balance. So that's why we come back to it in, in each session. We're gonna do a really funky movement now. So roll your thumbs down while you arch your back and look up. And roll your thumbs back while you round your body and look down. And go back and forth between that really strange movement a few times. And then pause for a moment. <clears throat> and put the arms up. And now just roll your arms and see if your thumbs have more mobility. If there's just a little bit more movement right in the middle of your torso. Upgrade I want is a camera that doesn't fall off when I try to adjust it. Okay. 
So now we're going to start working with your dominant hand. So your right hand, if you're right-handed or your left hand, if you're left-handed. And look at the palm of your hand and look at your fingers and let's look at the index finger. Look at where the creases are on your index finger. And if you bend your index finger, you'll see that it bends at the first crease and it bends at the second crease, but it doesn't really bend at the third crease. Because our body bends where we have joints. And if you turn your hand over to look at the back of your hand and you bend the first finger, you can see where that knuckle is. And then you bend at the second joint and you see where that knuckle is. But then the third joint is about an inch behind where the webbing is on your hand. That makes sense? So I want you to um, once hold your palm rigid so that you can't move that first finger knuckle and try and bend your first finger and feel how it's stiff and it doesn't move very well. And then use your fingers. You can grab with one finger on the top of the knuckle and one on the bottom and bend it right at the knuckle that you see on the back of the hand. And then with your other fingers, one at a time, find that knuckle, the knuckle that's below where your fingers leave your palm and encourage it to bend. There's a, a certain way that when your finger on the back side can push the joint and then the finger underneath pulls back toward your wrist and it helps that, that bend. And just go through all the fingers on that hand. Okay. And the thumb is particularly interesting. If you look at your palm on your thumb, there's, there's one crease because the thumb only has two bones to it. Not, um, sorry, it, its bone is further back. So you'll feel the one, one at the tip, one at the, the knuckle, but then its last bone back by the wrist. See if you can find that bottom bone of the thumb. It's way down near your wrist. If you take your thumb towards your pinky, that bone has to fold there. And use your thumb and touch your pinky, your fourth finger, your third, your first. Okay. And rest for a moment. Now hold your whole palm as if your palm was flat, as if your palm couldn't move. And try and move your fingers and feel how they don't move as well. And then allow them to move from that knuckle. It's funny how we have these like little mismaps in our brain. Sometimes you'll see someone or you might have, when you look at your hand, it's kind of this shape where your thumb is in line with your forearm. Everybody try putting your hand like that. And you can see it lights up the muscles in your forearm. And then turn your hand so that if you were going to rotate your forearm, you'd be rotating around your fourth finger. And that's a more accurate way based on the bones in the hand to rotate. You can hang your arm down as you do this experiment. What's it like if you rotate around the thumb or if you rotate around the fourth? 
and rest your hand for a moment. The other interesting place that people have a, a little bit of a mismatch usually in their hands is where their wrist is. So point to your wrist. What do you think of when you think of your wrist? Okay. Most of us think it's kind of where those crease lines are at the base of the palm. And we think of ourselves as a hinge joint there. So if you hold your palm and your fingers flat and bend there, see what range of motion you have. The wrist, there's two rows of bones in the wrist, and they come almost to the base of your thumb. And so this rounding movement in the wrist happens in those bones as well as where you're feeling the crease. So if you allow that rounding to happen in these bones, the hand can come much further down. I'm gonna share my screen for a moment and share a, just a picture of the hand bones. And you can see down toward the bottom, you can see the both, well, starting with what we were talking about before, if you look at the knuckles on the hand, you can see how far back they are from the skin where the fingers separate. And then if you trace the long bones of the fingers down, there's these two little rows right before the, the wrist. And those, there's some mobility that's possible in those bones. And so play a little bit with, with that bending. And the cool thing is everything a hand can do, uh, a foot, should be able to do. But many of us have feet that have toes that are crossed or hammer toes. And let's talk about how that might happen in the hand. So if your palm is rigid, or if the knuckles are stuck so that the fingers go up, in the toes what happened is that, that the end joint curls down so that you can feel the floor, kind of like if you were clawing something with your hand. If you make that clawing motion, you can feel how the back of the hand gets uh, rigid. Um, and that's what causes hammer toes. So getting flexibility in the joint in our toes right here is what's gonna make a difference in the hammer toes. And if your foot, when you put weight on it, if you put weight at a funny angle, that's what can make the fingers, uh, the toes cross under or cross above. So we're gonna play in our hand with how do you get the weight going through your hand in a way that your hand feels strong, and then we're gonna play with this stuff in our, in our feet. So with your right hand, many of you are sitting near a desk where your computer is. I want you to imagine that you wanted to shove this desk through the wall that it's in. You want to push it back. And if, if you don't feel good about doing that on your desk, you can find a wall to push. But experiment with what does it feel like if you push the wall from your thumb? And what does it feel like if you push the wall from this line underneath your fourth finger? So see how strong you feel when you're pushing in one spot or the other. Which one engages more of your back? Okay. Um, and our feet are the same way. How many people here, raise your hand if you have a bunion on one foot or the other? Okay. It's pretty, pretty common. Bunions come when you are big toe focused. And some arthritis in the hands comes from when you're thumb focused and you put the weight through the thumb. But when you put the weight through the um, fourth side, it lets you engage your back in a different way and to, to feel that power. So let's play with this a little bit in the feet. And for the feet, if you can, cross your leg so that you 
have it um, your foot up by your knee. And some of you will be able to do this. Some of you who have hip replacements may find it challenging or not okay to do because of, of your hip. If that's the case, maybe use your other leg. Um, or, or we're gonna do a little bit of work to try to make it a little easier. I'm just looking for a way that you can reach your foot. And if you have a shoe on this foot, take the shoe off. And I want you to try to find the knuckle on the big toe. And I know that there are some of you who are not going to be able to reach your feet. Um, so you can do this in your imagination. You can imagine somebody else is touching your toe and you'll get just as much from doing it if that's the case. So if sitting with your leg like this is torture, um, don't do it. Put your foot back down on the ground and imagine somebody is touching that knuckle. In fact, let's all put our, put our foot down for a moment and try and press the knuckle under the big toe in, in the ball of the foot, the one that's back an inch or two from where your toes separate. Push that into the floor a little bit. And then try and push the second one and go through your feet, just trying to push a little bit one at a time on your toes. Let me uncut off my head. And now go back through those knuckles and try and lift it off the floor a little bit. So in your hand, it might look like somebody had a grip of your hand and is pulling the middle up and that lifts these joints. In your foot, lifting the middle of your foot might help you lift those bones a little bit. And some of them are easier to talk to than others. <laughs> and if you can, cross your leg over. And for a moment, do the movements we did at the beginning where you pull your belly in and roll your pelvis back and look down. And then arch your back and look up. And just feel which of those positions makes it more comfortable for your leg to be across your knee. You'll find your knee goes up and down depending on what you do with your back. Okay. And grab, if you can, and otherwise imagine somebody else doing this to your foot. You reach around, like if this is my toe, I reach around my toe, grab this knuckle, and try and bend it. Feldenkrais said, in a healthy foot, you can touch every toe to the sole of your foot. For most of us, that's a, a, like, no way. And just go through your toes one at a time, trying to bend. Um, and you could also use two hands to try to move the knuckle to bend your toe to curl it toward the bottom of your foot. And just go through each toe a couple times. You don't have to pull hard. You're more, more think about doing it as informing your toe of going and informing your brain. Hey brain, remember this muscle, this joint knows how to close. Because for many of us, we, we forget that that joint knows how to close. And shoe manufacturers, I think, take advantage of this and they make the shoes that have the toes that curl up. And that trains us to not use these joints. 
So we get this vicious cycle going of your balance isn't good, so you get shoes that help with things and then your body lets go of the thing it needs to do. Okay, go back to your big toe, hold it from the end and twist it a little bit. And then uncross for a moment, give your hip a little break. And let's go back to our hands. And if you take your index finger and you twist it, you can twist it from the part that sticks out or you can slide back and there's the long bone that goes from this knuckle back to the beginning of your wrist bones. And you can put your fingers around that and try and rotate this bone. And it should be able to rotate a little bit in both directions. while you're here on your hand, go ahead and rotate the bones in the, the middle of your hand. And notice, do they roll toward your thumb easier or do they roll to your pinky easier? It's kind of a strange listening to yourself to notice which direction they roll. You can tell about your usage patterns based on that. If they roll to your thumb more, you've probably been relying on this side of your hand more than, um, than is good. You, you might have a little bit of this shape to your hand. And if they roll more toward the pinky finger, that's more the, the anatomical alignment with the hand of rotating around the, the fourth but just to, to notice what they do and to invite them to go in both directions. And there's that little groove in between the bones. You can kind of get your finger in there and that lets you get a grip to, to rotate. And after you've done that rotation, you might find it's a little easier in your hands to bend at this back knuckle. And then cross your foot over again, if you can, otherwise in your imagination. And get a hold of your foot and get your fingers in between those long bones in the, in the middle of your foot and try and rotate each of your toes a little toward the big toe or toward the little toe. It's often a little sensitive, kind of, I don't know, to me it's like that back rub pressure that it hurts, but it feels good. Like they, they want to move. And if, if you get to a spot that's just like exquisitely painful, use less pressure. Um, this isn't a shiatsu session. Um, so I mean, yeah, my, my toes rotate, but my fingers don't. Okay. Um, that's something that when you notice a pattern like that, it's get curious. I go, I wonder what's going on in my hands that my fingers don't rotate. Mm -hmm. And it probably has something to do with the connection between your fingers up into your shoulder. Like my fingers rotate easier if my shoulder does that same rotation. So it might be something to, to play with. Yeah. For today, I want to focus on the feet rotation because that's the part that's really important for balance. Joan, do you have a question? Or are you just adjusting? And notice in your feet, do your toes want to roll more in the direction of your big toe? If you have a bunion, that's probably what you're going to find. Or do they want to rotate a little more toward the little toe? It's like you can feel, do you pronate or supinate with your feet based on the direction these, these roll? But the invitation is all we're asking the toes is to just, hey, consider. There's a possibility of rolling the other way. Because to build the arch in the foot or the arch in the hand, the especially toes four and five or fingers four and five have to roll out and the others roll in. There, there's like a, 
our feet can grab. Theoretically, your big toe and your little toe could touch each other because your foot could fold under there. Okay. Now go back to each toe and pull it. Just try and make it a little longer, like you're inviting there to be space in the joints. And then go back to the knuckle and try and fold your toes under as if you wanted to touch a toe to the sole of your foot. And it has to start way back in the knuckles that are the, behind your toes. You just thank your feet for developing whatever crazy pattern of toes they've done. They've done it to help you with your balance. And we're just, as, as we work with your upper body on your posture and your balance, and we go back and forth with working with the foot, then everything settles into a little more functional pattern. Okay, put your foot down, take a little break. And stand up for a moment. And just feel, although some of you I think have one shoe on and one shoe off, which is gonna make things weird. If you're in that, sit down and take both your shoes off. Just realizing that it's gonna be very hard to compare sensations with one shoe on and one shoe off. And the first thing to notice when you're standing up is where's your weight? Do you feel like you have more weight in one side than the other? Do you feel taller, like there's a connection between your foot on one side all the way up to your head? Does one arm feel longer than the other? And is the temperature of one foot different? Does the floor feel higher or lower one side than the other? Any differences left and right? If you had to count on one side of your body, which side would you go, yeah, I feel more secure on that side? Just waking up our brain to all the bones in the foot settles that side. And transfer your weight left and right a few times. And on the foot you've been working on, experiment. As you transfer your weight away from that foot, do you push under the big toe to push you over? Or do you push more toward under your fourth toe to push you over? Feel how both of those are possible to get you over there. And when you push with your big toe, notice how your knee rolls in a little bit. If you have any knee problems, it will probably um, make your knee a little uncomfortable when you do that. And push with the fourth again. Now, if you wanted to, like you had a piano against you and you wanted to shove it away from you, would you wanna shove that piano by putting the weight under your fourth or under your big toe. I have the feeling if I put it under my big toe, I would fall over and land on top of the piano as I gave it a shove. But if I keep the weight out on the fourth, I have power to move over there, but I still have balance once I get there. And to sense, is it easier to, to feel in your foot when your weight is out toward the fourth toe and when it's toward the big. Just go back and forth a few times between where you put the weight on that foot. And now just standing with your weight even between the two sides, put your weight on the fourth and feel if it makes you get a little taller. And then roll your weight into your big toe 
and see if there's some subtle shrinking that you do in your chest. And when the weight's out to the fourth, if it lifts your, your chest. And roll the weight into the big toe and lift your arm and see where does it get hard. Like it's easy, it's easy, it's easy, and then it kind of gets stuck somewhere or it just feels heavy. Okay. And then roll the weight out to the fourth and lift your arm and see if your arm feels a little easier to, to move and be supported. So where we put our weight on our foot has just this tremendous impact throughout the, the body. But it's only possible to get your weight there when you really shift your weight onto that foot. So put your other foot behind the foot we've been working on. And as you shift your weight onto this foot that you've been working on, turn your belly so your belly goes over your foot a little bit. And feel how that just plants your foot and there's this lovely feeling of solidness as your toes widen and respond to it. Okay, come back to the back foot, come up to the front foot, but land on the inside of the front foot. And feel how your toes then kind of shorten this is part of what develops that hammer toe and the cross toe feeling, is the weight coming in. And if it's on the big toe, your weight's not quite on the side enough. And so your body does all these contortions to help hold you so you don't fall down. But if you come up over that foot, turn your belly over it, there's this, ah, the foot relaxes and lengthens. Okay, walk around for a moment just to feel your asymmetries. And see if there are very different sensations on the side we've been working in the foot, in the flexibility of the foot, in the way it connects to the floor, in your security when you're on that side. And come and sit down. And I'd love to hear from a few people, what differences did you feel in your foot as you walked around or in the rest of your body? You could just speak out. Please unmute yourself to talk. Um, I am... Uh, Going rolling over on the fourth toe is pretty much almost impossible for me, but I'm realizing I'm very pronated mm -hmm. where my feet roll in. So uh, I'm wondering if other people with that similar, you know, the inside of your heel on your shoe is worn down, have that same, they're stronger on their toe than their fourth foot, fourth toe, their big toe rather than their fourth toe. So, Laura, do you have a bunch, uh, is balance a challenge for you? Oh, of course. Yeah, okay. So, the, what I'm hoping that you'll begin learning during this session, and I hope you continue in May when we continue, is the, the ability to get your belly over your foot is what helps you learn how to not pronate. So, pronation, and it, it's, it, it can be learned to not do that, but it's, you've got to find the way to get your weight really over the foot and then the foot doesn't pronate. Hmm. Yeah. Because you're going to feel more familiar when you work with the big toe because that's what you've done for probably your, your whole life. If you, if you look at pictures of yourself as a little kid, you might find that you had that pattern. Um, usually our patterns start early and just get exacerbated by time and get exacerbated by Parkinson's. But you can learn a new pattern. Yeah. It's interesting. Sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Um, yeah. I was pigeon toed as a kid. Uh -huh. um, so I, my foot was, you know, I don't even think about this in relation to anything going on today. 
my, my foot was in a brace that where I was in these shoes overnight that divided my feet. I have no idea if that helped at all, but it was, it was a terrible experience. Um, but um, what I notice um, when I walk slowly is I grip with my toes and that seems to be my thought is I'm going to fall down. So I need to grip with my toes in order to stay, stay um, upright. Yeah, sometimes our brains think we're eagles and we got to hold on to that. <laughs> and um, that it is all about the torso getting over the foot is the only way that the toes will not do that gripping. And so that's the thing to, to go. And Stephen, I hope you can go back on the Northwest Parkinson's site and do some of the earlier classes from this series. They're all online there. Because okay, and, and also next month participate. We're working on getting our bodies over our feet so that that clawing doesn't happen. Because it gets to be this vicious cycle. You claw and then you develop the hammer toes or the cross toes and then your toes hurt and your shoes don't fit. And it, it we got to break that, that cycle. Um, speaking to the casting that's done for pigeon toes or bow legs, in my way of looking at it, if we work with a person's upper torso at the same time sometimes that the casting is going on, we have better results than if you just try and reshape the, the feet because there's, there's always a connection all the way up. And usually when people are pigeon-toed, everybody take your toes and, and turn them in so that you're pigeon-toed. And see what you feel right up in here, up in your chest. There's kind of a, a collapse in there. And then when you take your feet to be more straight or a little out, this area relaxes and opens. And you might find your weight shifts. If you go pigeon-toed, your pelvis rolls back a little bit and you pull your belly in. And then if you unpigeon toe, there's a more coming forward. So there, there is a whole connection there. But the, the, wow. cool, the cool thing is, you know, Parkinson's does its nasty stuff to the brain, but the brain still has the ability to learn and to um, sense that there are differences. There are possible different ways to organize yourself. And so you, you, learn what you can and it helps hold the symptoms of Parkinson's at bay for longer. Am I right? Yeah, Keith. I, I noticed the wear pattern on my shoes is kind of interesting. It's on the outside and in the middle. Can we take anything from that? Yeah, if, if the wear pattern is way outside, you're probably coming past your fourth all the way over to your fifth and rolling your ankles out a little bit. So, and if everybody just try that, try and put the weight under your fifth toe as you're sitting there, you'll feel how your knees roll out a little bit. So experiment when you're walking with, you can walk with your weight on the big toe line to your heel, on the first toe, the, the, well, the second toe, the third, the fourth, and the fifth, and experiment with what it feels like to walk with the lines slightly different. I think maybe we'll play with that on um, on Thursday because there's a really nice lesson around that. But just it, it's one of those that even to give our brain the idea that there are options like oh I could do that or I could do that. Um, those are, are things that will help and Again, it all comes down to what we do with our upper body because our upper body is what puts us on our, on our foot. I was thinking that- Stephen, those videos that Irene talked about are actually on YouTube. You just go to YouTube and search Northwest Parkinson's Golden Christ and- uh, Great, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Deborah. Um, I was noticing that I, I, my affected side is stiffer, you know? And so when I, I was doing my other side, my foot, I think the reason why the tops of my feet hurt is because I don't move my torso very well that direction, I think. I don't know. That, 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 makes, that makes a lot of sense. You're probably, your opposite hip isn't lifting the corner of your pelvis up and then the rotation. So the hip has to lift your torso 
and then you have to rotate your belly over the leg in order to get there. And so the, the torso related lessons might be good ones to go back um, probably the first three from this series. Okay. And do them specifically focused about getting your weight over the leg where the top of it hurts. Okay. It might be that your toes on that side are not bending at this joint because uh -huh. if the toes are pressing up against the top of your shoes, then the muscles in the top of your foot are oh. always engaged and so they're gonna get cranky. Okay, that makes um, sense. So playing with what we did today with bending this knuckle back and forth um, is on a regular basis will okay. help let That's the not. foot remember that it, it can go this way as well as that way. Okay. It's funny because for some of you, you'll find your feet get stuck like this and some the feet get stuck like this <laughs> but it's still often because this joint isn't bending and then the whole foot isn't making its its uh lateral or its lengthwise arch okay yeah. so today's the day i'm going to leave you lopsided um and you can play with your other foot and your other hand and explore where is this knuckle and how can it work? What are the, you know, can it, can it roll? Can it bend? Can it arch? Um, and just have fun. There's no, um, no necessary goal to the activity other than the exploration and the exploration builds the pattern in your brain. It's like pushing the plus sign on Google Maps. It just your map of your hand, the map of your wrist, gets better um, and clearer uh, in your body. So work on, on that mapping by playing with your hands and feet and then come back ready to talk about what that was like on Thursday. All right, any other comments about what this experience has been like today? When you stood up? Uh, I, have a Colleen. I have a question about the um there's a company, I think, in Olympia, and they sell these little um, pads to put under the kind of uh, behind your toe ball, whatever that mm -hmm. thing is. That's supposed to help with keeping your toes moving. Um, do you, is that, is it contraindicated if you're going to do the Feldenkrais method to do any physical adaptations like that? So for me, orthotics, um, and that, that's just like a mini orthotic, um, can be useful because sometimes when you wear them, other parts of you stop hurting and it's worth doing them to get yourself out of pain. But they backfire because when there's a lump under your foot, you end up pushing harder on that lump. And that pushing harder on the lump increases the pattern that got you into trouble in the first place. That's what I was wondering, yeah. So, um, if you need to wear orthotics, say, because you feel stabler when you're out going grocery shopping or whatever, wear them there, but don't wear them all the time so that you can do some explorations in the other time and relearn how to move your body in a way that it knows how to do that folding and that bending. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts from the, the class today? Uh, Elizabeth. Yes, I noticed that I'm much more grounded on the foot that we worked on. And on the other foot, I had noticed uh, a few months ago that one, the fourth toe has been uh, gripping the ground. And uh, just with working on the hand, it's not gripping as much. It's laying flatter when I put my foot on the floor. Yes, yes. You have discovered how our brains are organized. In, in, in our sensory map of ourself and our motor maps, the hands and the feet are right near each other and they function similarly and they develop at the same time embryologically. And so since our hands are a lot easier to reach, if your feet are bothering you, work with that hand. Like if your left foot's bothering you, work with your left hand doing the things we explored today and you'll find the foot relaxes. Great, mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that. Alrighty, let's call it a day and I'll see you all on Thursday morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen, Stephen Green. Could I, yes. Could I take your email so I can add you to our